call the case to order. Hello, good morning, Judge Niambe. Can you hear and see us clearly? Yes, I can see you all and I can hear you as well. It's okay. I think we're ready to start if um, everything is okay from your end. Everything is okay from my end. Oh. We may start. Yes, yes. Okay, we will start the recording and we will uh, in, in a couple of minutes. Thank you. All right, we will away. The International Residual Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals is now in session. La Jeanse Mechanism International, a pillier of excessive law functions residual the tribunal panel at Uet. Please be seated. Thank you, Registrar. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Before I go any further, I would like to announce the revised schedule of breaks for today. Due to the change in the cleaning protocol, the breaks will be reduced to 40 minutes today instead of the one hour we had yesterday. Secondly, I think I have an apology to make to co counsel for the Mladic defense team. Inadvertently yesterday, I referred to him as Mr. Lukic, who is the lead counsel and not present. Let the record show that the co counsel for Mr. Mladic, Mr. Ivertage, is the one representing the appellant today. That said, as I stated yesterday, only the person who is speaking may have their microphone turned on. All others, kindly keep your microphones off until such time as you are invited to speak. Thank you for your kind of cooperation. We will now proceed. Mr. Mladic, you can understand the proceedings in the language you understand? Yes, I can, Your Honor. And for the record, the appearances for the prosecution. Can you put them? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, Laurel Baig and Barbara Goy for the prosecution. We're joined by our case manager, Ms. Janet Stewart. And today we'll be joined by our colleagues, Catherine Marsden, Maria Yakusheva, and Marisa Bassett. Thank you. For the defense, for the record, appearances, Par please. Pardon me, Your Honor. I have to correct that for a moment. It's Marie Devoise who will be joining us today. Very well. Now for the defense. Madam Presiding Judge, Your Honors, appearing on behalf of Mr. Mladic, co-counsel Mr. Ivetic, 
and Draga Ivetic and uh, legal consultant uh, Pita Louise Bagot. And no apologies are needed, Your Honor, for um, referring to me as Mr. Lukic. It's understandable. Thank you. Thank you. We will now continue. The appeals chamber will now continue to hear the prosecution's appeal. Counsel for the prosecution, you may start. Thank you, Your Honors. I'd like now to turn to Mladic's ground five concerning Srebrenica. Your Honors, in July 1995, Mladic used the Bosnian Serb forces under his command to execute thousands of Bosnian Muslim men and boys and to forcibly displace tens of thousands of women, children, and elderly men from Srebrenica. He did this as a member of a joint criminal enterprise, which included Radovan Karadzic and a number of Mladic's subordinates. Their purpose was to eliminate the Bosnian Muslims in Srebrenica. The JCE initially included the commission of the crimes of persecution and forcible transfer. And by the early morning of 12th of July, 1995, genocide, extermination, and murder became part of the means to achieve this objective. That's paragraph 5096. None of Mladic's challenges show any error in the chamber's sound conclusions. I'll begin my submissions with a brief overview of Mladic's key role in the Srebrenica crimes. And I will then turn to Mladic's main arguments about the forcible displacement operation and the murder operation. Starting with an overview. Your Honors, the trial chamber convincingly concluded that Mladic was instrumental to the crimes in Srebrenica. He commanded and controlled the coordinated actions of the VRS and the police forces sub subordinated to him, personally overseeing the implementation of this critical operation. And as with the takeovers in the other municipalities, the chamber found that the goal of the attack on Srebrenica was to make the enclave disappear, to empty it, to make it Serb territory. Paragraph 4975. And on the 11th July, 1995, after his forces had taken control of the area. Mladic conducted a victory walk through the town, declaring it Serb Srebrenica. After the fighting was over, he signaled the crimes that were to come, announcing that now, quote, the time has come to take revenge on the Turks. Mladic's forces directly attacked Bosnian Muslim civilians. They shelled mosques and threw grenades into homes. They ordered the civilians to leave, threatening them, forcing them out. As many as 15,000 Bosnian Muslims, mostly men, fled through the forest in an attempt to, to reach Muslim-held territory in what is referred to as the column. The rest of the population sought refuge at the UN compound in nearby Potachari. By the end of the day, on 11th July, several thousand Bosnian Muslims, mainly women, children, elderly and injured men, 
were already gathered inside the UN compound. And by the next morning, the displaced population had swelled to 25 to 30,000. Trial judgment, 2453. They spent one or two nights in catastrophic conditions. Serb forces continued shelling and firing in the surrounding areas. They killed, mistreated, raped, and intimidated refugees. And the situation was so desperate that some committed suicide. On the 12th of July, Mladic supervised as his forces put the women, children, and elderly onto buses for transfer, transport to Bosnia Muslim territory. Some they had to force on board. And it was Mladic who ordered the mobilization of these buses. He ordered the road to be opened for the transfer. And he ultimately ordered the transportation of the Bosnian Muslims out of Potocari. And over the course of two days, Mladic's men forcibly transferred around 25,000 Bosnian Muslim civilians to Bosnian Muslim held territory. And as the civilian population was being loaded onto buses, males, including boys as young as 12, were separated out, torn from their terrified families. In Mladic's presence, by soldiers under his command, paragraph 5052. Mladic's forces collected about 1,000 Muslim men and boys in a nearby building in Pochachari referred to as the White House. They confiscated their identity documents and personal belongings. And later, these were piled up and burned. And pursuant to Mladic's orders, all around the area, units under his command focused on blocking the men who had fled in the column from reaching ABIH-held territory. Firing on them with tanks and anti-aircraft guns, calling on them to surrender, threatening their families, promising that they would not be harmed. Some surrendered. Some were captured. Mladic's forces detained the Bosnian men by the thousands in a football stadium, a meadow, along the sides of the main road. And when Mladic traveled around the area on the 13th of July, he spoke to thousands of Bosnian Muslim men being detained by his soldiers. He offered them false assurances of exchange knowing full well that the plan was to kill them. And giving orders that furthered that plan, ordering his subordinates to stop registering the names of the prisoners in their custody, ordering their busing to other locations where they would then be murdered. And over the next hours and days, Mladic's forces detained the Bosnian Muslim prisoners from Pochachari and from the column on buses, and they crammed them into warehouses and schools and other makeshift detention facilities in inhumane conditions where many were severely mistreated. Paragraphs 2946 to 2961. And in the meantime, starting already on the 12th of July, the killings began. First, just a few, and then on a massive scale. A scale not seen on European soil since the Second World War. Many of the detainees were killed on the spot. 1,000 were killed where they were detained in the Kravitsa warehouse on the night of the 13th of July and others were systematically moved to more and more remote areas, to fields, to a military farm, to a dam, and there they were executed by
by the handful, by the dozens, by the truckload, by the hundreds, and ultimately by the thousands. By gunfire and grenade. Without regard to their civilian or military status, based only on their identity as Bosnian Muslims. Their bodies falling into holes or moved to hidden mass graves. Heavy equipment used to hide their remains. And later their bodies were moved again. When some were found, some had their hands tied, some were wearing blindfolds, and some are still missing. Mladic was key to the success of this operation. Not only was he present, giving orders, supervising, and directing, he also played a critical and high-level role in keeping the international community from stopping these massacres. Mladic ordered the press to be excluded from the area, not to conceal military activities, but to conceal the murders. And he lied to the international media, including by selling staged video footage of food distribution in Potocari to international media agencies. That's paragraph 2438, 5047 of the judgment. He lied to international authorities and officials. He didn't investigate or punish any of his subordinates. And then in September and October of 1995, when the international community identified some of the mass graves, Mladic tried to cover up their genocidal slaughter by using his forces to dig up the victims' bodies with heavy machinery, trucking the bodies to more secret locations, and then reburying them commingling bodies from different graves, and commingling body parts from different victims in a gruesome attempt to hide their incriminating remains. Mladic was in charge of the Srebrenica operation. Srebrenica was Mladic's operation. And the chamber was right to conclude that he was criminally responsible for these crimes. Let me now turn to Mladic's arguments about the persecutory forcible transfer operation. His main contention is that this was a humanitarian evacuation rather than a criminal displacement. This same argument was considered and rejected by the trial chamber. And I'd like to highlight today three reasons why Mladic's view is unreasonable. First, he ignores that the forcible removal of the Bosnian Muslims, Muslim population of Srebrenica was part of the Bosnian Serb leadership's long-term plan to remove Bosnian Muslims from Eastern Bosnia. Second, he ignores the displacement was violent and coercive. And third, he ignores that the, that the displacement did not meet international law governing humanitarian evacuations. Starting with the long-term plan. Like the takeovers of many other municipalities in the overarching JCE, which began in early 1992, the Srebrenica takeover was devised with the intent to permanently remove the Bosnian Muslim population living there. The trial chamber reasonably concluded that the goal of the attack was to make the enclave disappear, to empty it, and to make it Serb territory. Paragraph 4975. Of course, Mladic stated so explicitly in Directive 4, which was issued in November 1992. 
And just to recall, directives are the highest level of political military direction for the conduct of the war. And in Directive 4, Mladic set the objective to eliminate Bosnian Muslim population from the Srebrenica enclave. In addition to crushing the enemy forces, Mladic also set the goal of forcing the army to leave the enclave, quote, with the Muslim population. And I would refer you to the finding at 2359 of the judgment. His express intention was to inflict the heaviest possible losses on the enemy so that they were forced to leave the area along with the Muslim population. This is a criminal goal. And it was recognized as criminal. In 1993, when the United Nations Security Council set up the safe area in Srebrenica, it condemned the deliberate actions of the Bosnian Serbs to, quote, force the evacuation of the civilian population from Srebrenica as part of its abhorrent campaign of ethnic cleansing. So ethnic cleansing by forcible displacement, preventing this outcome was the very reason why UN peacekeepers were sent to the area. And I refer you to paragraph 2361 of the judgment. By the, sp the spring of 1995, Mladic's soldiers had already forcibly displaced many tens of thousands from the other municipalities. Srebrenica was one of the only municipalities standing bet between Mladic and his fellow JCE members' goal of an ethnically cleansed Serbian state that included all of Eastern Bosnia. And the plan to achieve this critical goal was set out in Directive Number 7 of March 1995. This directive was drafted in Mladic's main staff and signed by Karadzic. And the plan was to create a, quote, unbearable situation of total insecurity with no hope of further survival or life for the inhabitants of Srebrenica that would, end quote, that would leave the Muslim population with no choice but to leave the area. And I refer you to paragraph 2383 of the judgment. Following this plan, Mladic further restricted humanitarian aid, crippling both the population and the United Nations Dutbat forces, Dutch Bat forces that were protecting the enclave. Paragraph 2360. Mladic argued yesterday, as he did at trial, that Directive 7 1, signed by Mladic, replaced Directive 7. The trial chamber considered this argument and reasonably rejected it in light of win witness evidence to the contrary, and in particular, the evidence showing that the subsequent orders including orders issued by Mladic, referred to both Directive 7 and 7-1. The trial chamber concluded that Directive 7-1 did not rescind or amend the content of Directive 7, but merely translated it into operational military tasks. And I refer you to paragraph 2385 and 2386 of the trial judgment. And one of the examples of military orders that refer to both Directive 7 and 7-1 is the Kravaya 95 order, which my learned friend referred to yesterday. This was the order to attack the Srebrenica enclave. Mladic claims that the prosecution has conceded that this was a permissible military order. But again, he's misstating the prosecution's position. 
From the beginning of the case, the prosecution has maintained that this order had both a legitimate military objective and a criminal one. It was legitimate to seek to prevent the ABIH army from attacking and to seek to sever contact between the two enclaves. But the order also sets the task of creating the conditions for the elimination of the enclaves. And on the face of that order, Mladic and the other JCE members involved in the attacks intended to achieve the crime of removing the Muslim population. And this is why the chamber found that the purpose of the attack was to make the enclave disappear. And then in early July 1995, Mladic for Mladic's forces attacked and Mladic led them to military victory over the town. And then he displaced or killed all of the Bosnian Muslims living there. And this brings me to my second point. Mladic's arguments claiming a humanitarian evacuation ignore that the displacement operation was violent and coercive. There was nothing humanitarian about this operation. On the contrary, it was barbaric. Mladic claims that he gave civilians a choice, but he conveniently ignores all of the chamber's findings about the force used to cleanse the Bosnian Muslims from the territory. The fear created by the many years of ethnic cleansing, the force that created the terrifying and coercive conditions, the violence used to separate the men and boys from their terrified families, and to force the people onto buses. And ultimately, Mladic's account ignores what happened to the men who were separated or captured. Nearly all of them were killed. Only a few managed to survive. Many were subjected to what the chamber calls appalling abuse before they were executed. Paragraph 3298. There can be no humanitarian explanation that is consistent with the fact that thousands of Bosnian Muslims were executed. The trial chamber was correct to conclude that the circumstances were so coercive that there was no genuine choice whether to stay or go. Turning to the legal requirements. Mladic also ignores that the forced displacement did not meet any of the criteria for a legal displacement under international law, as set out, for example, in Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention or Article 17 of Additional Protocol 2. First, there was no imperative military reason for this displacement. Second, the removal was not carried out for the security of those involved. Hostilities had already ended before the people were bussed out. The only remaining risk, the only remaining risk, was that posed by Mladic's own forces. And the law does not permit Mladic to use the coercive conditions that he created to justify the forcible removal of the population. And I would refer you, for example, to the Perlich Appeals Judgment at paragraph 495. Third, the removal was not meant to be a temporary one. Speak. Could you kindly pause? We have lost the feed for the presiding judge. Thank you.
ठीक ठीक है मैडम प्रोसाइडिंग चार्ज कैन यू हियर एंड सी अस नाउ यस थैंक यू आई एम एबल टू हियर यू नाउ यस देन वी कैन प्रोसीड थैंक यू यस देन वी कैन प्रोसीड थैंक यू Madam Presiding Judge, should I just proceed where I left off when I was informed that you were cut out? That would be nice. Okay. Uh, thank you. I'll start with my third point. The removal was not meant to be a temporary one. The VRS burned down Bosnian Muslim homes and religious buildings, leaving nowhere to return to. And it does not matter to this analysis that the UN was involved in any aspect of this displacement. Mladic's claim that this alleged coordination and cooperation wasn't given sufficient weight is simply irrelevant. The involvement of humanitarian actors does not make the illegal displacement lawful. And I would refer you, for example, to the Stackage Appeals ch Judgment at paragraph 286. Nor does it undermine the Chamber's sound conclusions on Mladic's intent. Mladic did, we did meet with UN officials to discuss the removal of the civilian population. Notably, he met with them three times at the Hotel Fontana. But keep in mind, as the trial chamber did, that at this point in time, Mladic's forces had attacked the UN peacekeepers and their bases. It had issue, he had issued ultimatums to the UN to surrender weapons. And Mladic's forces were detaining Dutch bat peacekeepers. Mladic was threatening to kill them if NATO airstrikes continued. The chamber was well aware of this threatening context when it considered Mladic's statements. At the Hotel Fontana meetings, this was not harmless military language, as Mladic argues. Nor does anything turn on whether the trial chamber relied on Coaster's account of an interaction with Mladic or the related trial video that was discussed yesterday. The difference in language is not material. Ultimately, after allowing the UN to accompany one convoy, Mladic's men stole Ju Dutch Bat's jeeps, weapons, and equipment, making it impossible for the UN to provide any further escorts. Paragraph 2557 of the judgment. And the United Nations did not agree that the transfer was legal. When on the 17th of July, Dutch Bat Deputy Commander Franken was asked to sign a prepared declaration that the so-called evacuation was in accordance with international law, he added that the UN was only able to observe the first convoy. And the circumstances of this declaration are important. The UN at that time was still trying to, safe, to secure the safety of a small number of injured Bosnian Muslims. Nor does it matter that the so-called representatives of the Muslim population were involved in discussions. The law is clear. Representatives, even democratically elected ones, cannot authorize forcible transfer. But the so-called representatives involved in this case were not really representing anyone. The chamber found that they were designated as representatives, not by the Muslim population, but by the Serb side, paragraph 2476. And even though they were not real representatives, Mladic warned them that the fate of their people was in their hands, warning that Bosnian Muslims could, quote, live or vanish, end quote and, quote, either survive or disappear, end quote. Paragraph 2477. 
In any event, Your Honors, that some individuals purportedly wanted to leave does not make the displacement a legal evacuation. The circumstances show that the situation was so coercive that no one was in any position to make a genuine choice. Mladic's statement recorded on film suggesting that the displaced population had a choice is disproved by all of the surrounding circumstances. And the intercepted evidence where Mladic did not know that he was being recorded is better evidence of his true intent. Mladic was clear in his private conversations when he was inter intercepted saying that all of the Bosnian Muslims should be removed, including those who do not want to leave. That can be found at paragraph 5004 of the judgment and paragraph 5128. The victims did not have a genuine choice. The only reasonable conclusion based on the totality of the evidence is that the Bosnian Muslims of Srebrenica were forcibly displaced. This was a criminal forcible transfer, not a legal evacuation in humanitarian on humanitarian grounds. And Mladic has shown no error. I'm turning now, Your Honors, to Mladic's arguments about the murder operation. Mladic tries to distance himself from the murders in different ways. And I intend to address four of them today. First, concerning the JCE meeting. Second, his so-called alibi evidence. Third, Nikolic's evidence. And fourth, the status of the victims. Your Honours, I'd just like to check before I proceed because this first section is going to take longer than the four minutes remaining in this session. Would you prefer that I begin or would you like me to stop here for the break? Well, it may, if it's, uh, it's agreeable with you, we can stop now and resume after 40 minutes to go into the longer submission. Thank you, Your Honours. We break now. All right, we will be. So we stopped at ten twenty. 